Lies of P is a new entry into the designated category known as Souls Likes. The term originating through From Software's critically acclaimed Dark Souls. I say Dark Souls over Demon Souls because, let's be honest, even though this was the beginning, the name didn't catch on until the Dark Souls trilogy. The game takes cues from all three staples from From's action genre, mixing the larger than life bosses from Dark Souls to the frantic speed of Bloodborne and the precision and timing of Sekiro. All of these conflicting ideologies would surely lead Neo Wizards and Round 8's new game into a pool of mediocrity and ultimately coming up short right? Well it didn't. The main point which is being tossed around the community at the minute is whether or not Liza P is a competently made Souls-like. Well, yeah, it is. Although the question which should be asked, which unfortunately will never gain traction, is whether or not this exceeds from software. I know, it's a scary thought. Well, the answer to that is a lot more complicated than you think. The word inspiration is a funny one. You can be inspired to do something from someone else. This doesn't automatically make what you're doing good. The distinction is important to understand. Due to the title of this video, it would appear as if the question were accusing the game of either being a win or a loss. It isn't that black and white. Something truly terrible can have moments of greatness, and sure enough, inspiration can come from anywhere. We all want to achieve something in life and you can't get by without a little help. So with that being said, when something comes along which has certain similarities to something that came before, the automatic reaction can be, oh it's not as good as so and so, or Oh no, that's straight up plagiarising. I'm not going to spend too long on this point. There are so many different videos out there that go into detail about this current topic. So with that being said, where does Liza P land? There is no question in that the game would never exist without Dark Souls or Bloodborne. The points of contention being it's a Souls-like with a dark atmosphere which is more akin to Bloodborne than Dark Souls, but to say that it rips off or is a cheaper version is unfounded. Despite simultaneously being a homage to Bloodborne's tone and world, the setting is intrinsically rooted in its own philosophy. The level of care which was placed into illustrating the works of Carlo Collodi in its execution was outstanding. All the beats of the story are twisted to portray this world of horror and death through a very grim depiction of the chosen fable Pinocchio. The world is rife with colour and intrigue. Everywhere you look, the game bleeds atmosphere. You get lost in it all as you wander the streets of Krat. World building created through a small but impactful cast of NPCs makes the setting feel lived in. Customary to this genre, it is automatically clear that you would never want to live in this environment, which is the perfect way of keeping the player on edge throughout their playthrough. The main aspects which are driven from the story of Pinocchio are the expectation of humans and what makes a human. Is it the weight of our actions or the body we inhabit? The game incorporates this philosophy in both its story and gameplay with the notion of lying being a crucial point to the development of P himself slowly etching closer to humanity. The concept of currency in these games has some kind of intrigue towards it, whether it be souls which govern everything in the world like in Dark Souls, each one getting stronger than the last, or the echoes of a past kill being seeped into your very being. Liza P's version of this is called Ergo. Ergo continues the relationship to the game's primary message. Ergo is the essence of life, something every human contains. It can be obtained through experimentation or excursion of the petrification disease. The disease in question is the cause of the collection of Ergo itself. As people die from becoming stone, their life essence is solidified. This essence is then used to increase the power of humanity or it can be used to give life to a puppet. Honestly, I love the way Ergo dictates the story of the game, but I digress, the currency has a purpose, so yeah, all the themes collide to tell the essential story and somehow, although it all sounds so dumb, it all works. Somehow, it all works. We're not reinventing the wheel here. The game plays like a Souls like. You have your usual healing items, your checkpoint system, your boss runbacks. Although, for this instance, even From seem to be moving away from this fact with the likes of Sekiro and Elden Ring. But the difference here is the way it's executed. Everything has a purpose in P. No item feels out of place thematically. The care in which From put into how their items are shown through the world is on display here. For example, the healing item known as a pulse cell is an 
injection of ergo cells from the P-organ, which grant you more life essence. Gemini acts as your lantern, guiding you through your path. Stargazers are bonfires, a clear connection to humanity's interest in trying to ascend to a higher path, where they can wish and reach that star. Everything has a purpose, and it's all immaculately executed. In terms of how P controls, it's great. With the same 360 degree control seen in all From games bar Dark Souls 2, there was never a time the movement felt clunky or stiff, something which a lot of Souls-like suffer from. The fluent animation changes from both P and enemies is absolutely amazing, and I will go into it all later. But from more recent games of the same genre, such as Jedi Survivor, no shade on Respawn, but the animations are not fluent. You can tell when one animation begins with your lightsaber as it robotically switches to the next. Not in P. As an animator myself, I can comment that the animation animation fidelity shown in the game is polished, like really polished. The care that went into how everything moves is beautiful, for example when looking at how a fable art is executed from either heavy or light weapon, P swings his body in this perfect arc where he is then changed to the next animation. The anticipation and reaction in each swing from start to contact is tight, 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 as well as believable. The weight shift in each boss's movesets is remarkable. Rather than all bosses having a moveset in which they follow, they all move like their own personal weight would suggest. The majority of the first half of the game has the player fighting puppets with a very deliberate movements, stiff animations, sharp and precise. And seeing the setting of this game, I thought, right, this is what we're focused on, small team, easy to find animation, nothing to worry about. But then mid-game, you will have fights which are straight up humanoid. Alchemist Brian moves with the strength and weight in which someone of his stature would. He's heavy, the wind-ups the moves are deliberate. It is crucial for the animations in these games to be spot on. Timing is everything in this genre. Through the harsh difficulty, the player has to feel comfortable that they can achieve the impossible task set before them. This is why, despite speed, everything in Sekiro can be learned and perfected. To see an unknown developer who have never attempted this level of craft before throw the hat in the ring, yeah that was a joke, and succeed so flawlessly is actually inspiring. Either P starts the game in his static animations as he is a simple puppet, but as the game progresses his movement becomes more fluent because of his humanity seeping in. Honestly, every single boss and enemy in this game has complex, beautiful, fluid animations which are on par or even in some cases surpassed from. Combat is broken into three stages, the first being the usual combat in Souls likes, the staple dodge or roll mechanics are realised in this game. They work really well. I can't testify for how most of the hitboxes work with dodging through a lot of the attacks because because I was too fixated on the second layer of combat. Guarding is where the genre starts to combine different philosophies of past from titles. Taking inspiration from Sekiro, the parry system incorporates that same ideology, where a perfect parry will not break your posture, in this game, you will not lose health. The game also borrows the spark animation from Sekiro when a perfect guard is executed. The screen will flash as sparks fly from your weapon as well as an audio cue, but that's not all that's included. Like Bloodborne's rally system, the game incorporates this mechanic into its core nature too. The mechanic is, in my honest opinion, implemented better in Liza P than Bloodborne, as a regaining of health in this game doesn't intrinsically destroy the pace of the fight. If you want more information on how it does in Bloodborne, you can check out my video on it. No, through the ability to guard oncoming attacks, this also heals your health, meaning you never become out of sync by hitting an enemy frantically trying to stagger them to get health back. The enemies also, for the first time in this genre, share this mechanic. This is the reason for introducing the non-diegetic components in which help the player understanding the UI. Through the ability to regain health, like shown in Bloodborne, the health will lessen in opacity, showing the player that they can retain their lost HP. However, my big shock to play in the demo was the inclusion of the groggy bar, later renamed to Stagger. When the boss's posture is broken, you can attack them with a charged attack to get them ready for a repost. As the game goes on, the bosses will have moves which occur before you get it off. I'll admit, this can be frustrating. Is it cheap? Mm, yeah, a bit, but you're also getting a free repost off an enemy which will deal high damage, so the trade-off isn't too bad. I think the UI is brilliant for this game. Can the HUD be a bit too much on the screen? Yeah, but like any other Souls game, you need to see all of this at all times. It's just a given of the genre at this point. Status effects are common in this genre, but in P, I feel as if this implementation is the best I've ever seen. There are so many status effects in this game, ranging from shock all the way to disruption. Where the game differs is how it can affect each fight to either harm you or benefit you. For example, being corrupted, shocked or overburnt will result in you taking visual damage from the element in question. But when the tables are turned and you inflict the same damage on your enemies, the chosen affliction will change the colour of their health points. This is such a great improvement, I was blown away when I saw this. For something so small, it retroactively allows the player to visually see at a glance when the enemy has finally received the damage and continues to have the status until it returns to the original white hue. This is fantastic. It allows for a quick glance at the status and then you continue with the fight. So back to the stagger bar. It flashes crazy quick, indicating that one, you have a short time to get this hit off and having it bright white allows the player to see it straight away. These are minor things, but they are massive for the optical feedback in which 
which a player will experience in the heat of the moment. Like, my god, why are so little people talking about this incredible feature? The stagger also allows for bosses recurring health to finally deplete completely. Called fatal attacks, the player can remove the regaining health of an enemy with one of these animations, ceasing the ability for the boss to regen. This retroactively gives more of an incentive to break boss posture, while simultaneously interacting with the guard system to break said posture. Honestly, this game does it better than Elden Ring. Rather than breaking a boss's posture with as many heavy attacks or jumping attacks as possible, you are completely engaged in all the mechanics of the boss as you whittle its health down to the end. Status effects aren't just poison resistance or straight up death. Each effect has different attributes in which can affect the player and the enemies in question. I'll be quick as I can with all of them. Overheat sets you on fire as well as decreasing the amount of health regain you collect off a successful hit. Electric shock electrocutes you as well as drains your fable bar making it harder to pull off powerful moves. Corruption, poison see, yeah, it's simple. Break makes your pulse cells less effective when it's being used. Shock limits your stamina recovery time. Decay poisons you while simultaneously blunting your weapon. And disruption straight up kills you. Having more effects on these attributes led me to be more cautious on what I was being afflicted with as well as what to use for each type of enemy. Puppets are mostly susceptible to electricity as it messes with their body chemistry. Carcasses are freakish elemental enemies and as such burning them does more damage and humans are very susceptible to acid for obvious reasons. Yeah, I think the status effects play into each mechanic of the game incredibly incredibly well. Depending on your playstyle, you will gravitate towards a certain aspect of the combat system. Being a Sekiro fan, I focused on parrying everything. This wasn't a good idea because it made the game longer and way harder. But then again, you can't just roll through everything either and chip away damage. After progressing to New Game Plus, I found a comfortable balance between the two where one is just as important as the other. You cannot play this like Sekiro, Bloodborne or Dark Souls. You have to play it like Liza P. NeoWiz didn't make the game easy to do this though. The parry mechanic is so good in this game. The ability to parry any enemy as much as you want without doing damage, but instead posture damage, as well as a weapon durability, was a welcome inclusion. If you continue to rapidly parry enemies and bosses' weapons, they will break. This is due to the mechanic in which the player has to abide by as well. The weapon durability system is the best of its kind I've seen in these types of games, like hands down. We all hate the fact that eventually our weapon will break in a fight, especially Dark Souls 2 because it's just so short, my, my god. The way in which you fix weapon durability after Dark Souls 1 is by sitting at a bonfire. So what's the point of even having it? There isn't one. But then Liza P thought, this could be quite an interesting mechanic. When I first saw this inclusion, I was like, that is really cool. Is it gonna get annoying for how fast these bosses move? And again, no it didn't. There was only one fight here, I needed to use a fast repair kit instead of the long animation of using the grinder, and that was with Romeo. But that attempt was so scuffed anyway, so that, that's my bad. Again, this is an amazing feature in which the game uses for both a crux on the player and the enemy, which is the fairest way of using a mechanic like this, keeping everything even. The moment the weapon breaks isn't just a win for you, you'll find the bosses becoming more aggressive and up close and personal with you as the weapon is shorter and inflicts less damage, so they are way more aggressive. The dynamic of changing a weapon can shake up a flow of the fight and in some cases even make the boss transition into the next phase, even if their health bar isn't depleted. I can't do this mechanic justice for how how much it keeps the player engaged in each fight. Even showing the visual of your broken weapon as you wield it, something From has never done. Every main boss in Liza P is a spectacle, something I cannot say for a single From game. I want to preference this by stating, I am not saying From does not have spectacle bosses, I mean come on we all know that they do. No, what I'm saying is, whenever you look at any From game, whether it be Dark Souls 3, Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2, I don't know why I did that order, Bloodborne, Sekiro or even Elden Ring, they all have a boss where you're like, well that was kind of mid. Somehow, Liza P doesn't have this in its main boss lineup. Closest being Door Guardian, but I'm not even sure if that's a main boss. Instead, the bosses are all unique in both their design and their mechanics. I don't really know how to describe what I mean, so I'll go through each one highlighting why they are amazing as well as demonstrating how sometimes they will exceed from themselves. The first boss of the game is the equivalent of your Asylum Demon encounter. The Parade Master is a wake-up call in which tells players, yep, we are starting with a high-skilled enemy. Is this boss perfect? No. It does have some problems, 
but it's still visually incredible and the moves are fun to parry and dodge. Where the boss is problematic is the timings of the guards that you'll have to do. His moves are delayed and his body contorts in these beautiful animations as he spins around, but the boss is considerably easier if you dodge for the fight rather than guarding, apart from the fury attacks. Fury attacks are moves in which both enemies and bosses can do in which you have to either perfectly guard to take no damage or dodge out of the way. You cannot iframe these attacks, but primarily this boss is hard to perfect parry or moves, especially in phase 2, so overall it doesn't really prepare people for the parry centric experience you are about to encounter. But what do I think about the fight? I love this fight, I think this design is incredible, you can see the care that was taken when designing this boss. It's a nod to the parade master of the original fable, but I love the aesthetic of the circus puppet essentially. Having him drop the cage and rip his head off and swing it as a weapon is amazing, it's so creative, and this is just the beginning of the game. The health is generous for a first boss, and the soundtrack is brilliant. I love the soundtrack in P. I've heard a lot of people talking about the record music and how great that is, and don't get me wrong, it really is, but the boss music is just awesome. Overall, I think the fight is brilliant, despite the fact that it does detract Souls veterans from engaging with the parry system, leaning closer to dodging, which is a mistake when encountering... This feels like a better beginning boss honestly, but the spectacle of this fight feels perfect for the location so it's a double edged sword in that regard. My reasoning for this being the better beginning fight is the Watchman's attacks are simpler to understand due to his telegraphed nature. This was another great aspect of P. Even as the game gets more and more ridiculous with the difficulty from bosses, every single attack in which is thrown at you is fair. The windows for punishing after each attack are also fair, and somehow it still feels like you're relentlessly attacking with the animation fidelity of something like Elden Ring. But unlike that game, each boss has enough time for you to punish before the start of the next combo. The Watchman focuses on a fully melee attack pan, chaining combos which range from 3 to 5 moves. These range from simple slaps to charge up swinging arms. I love these animations. Not only do they look amazing with the socket style puppet aesthetic, but the charge up feels fair and readable. This is what I mean when the moves are telegraphed better for teaching parrying rather than the parade master. There is a grab in this fight which is extremely difficult to time the parry for, as it does feel like a spring trap which goes off after a long wind up, but it is easy to iframe. You better hope you can do this because it does insane damage. Using the dodge for this move is very beneficial because it teaches the player that the fights are not meant to be played with one playstyle or the other, but rather used in tandem. This is one of my favourite bosses in the game. I am still stunned that this was the end of the demo. The animations of the Watchmen are extremely impressive for such an inexperienced team. The design, once again, is amazing, taking on the police aesthetic which acts as security. However, the battery kept faulting all the time, which is a great explanation for the phase 2 electric stance. Genuinely, apart from the grab attack being very difficult to deal with, this boss is perfect. Flame Boy is a lot harder than the first two due to the very timings for parrying. Once again, having a wonderful design, literally being a living furnace which moves so robotically, this small change in animation is brilliant to see. It shows that this particular creation was not made to be seen by the public, its moves are not that fluent whatsoever, and as such don't need to be. This changes the pace the fight plays at. A lot of the moves are very static, some moves such as the overhead hammer are very difficult to parry due to the static nature of the boss. Is this a problem? No, not really. This is the third boss of the game, it's demanding, yes, but it's also completely fair. Fuoco is the first boss to incorporate ranged attacks into its moveset. The tell for this is also fantastic. He sidesteps and then shoots the cannon on his left hand. The bullets he throws at you can do both physical damage and overheat buildup, and as stated previously, when this goes off, you will continuously lose damage, as well as gaining less health from rallying. That may be why this fight feels so difficult when parrying. He will also throw oil onto the floor, which he can ignite. Again, this is a fantastic move. The fact that the boss affects the area around them, as well as moves themselves, creates this great friction with the entire area becoming part of the fight. Phase 2 has Fuoco ignite the majority of the arena. This move builds up your status meter incredibly fast. This can be avoided by standing behind a pillar in the room. I love this fight. The number of mechanics at play for a third boss of the game are amazing to see. The arena acting as an obstacle in itself was refreshing for these types of fights. The fight also has one of the tightest windows for achieving a stagger. This can be rather harsh for so early in the game, however I feel that it teaches the player that sometimes you should be a aggressive because you don't know how much time you have to get it off. Even so, this is, like I said, one of the smallest windows for a stagger in the entire game, so take what you will from that. The fight marks the end of the puppet fights for the time being. I can't believe 
this is the fourth boss of the game. The level of craft in this boss is suited for an end game or even a final boss of these types of games. Archbishop Andreas is one of the most visually compelling bosses I've seen in any game of this genre. With a monstrous form which is animated perfectly, he stomps around with the weight of a mad frog thing. You can see the carcass literally being dragged along the floor when the pathetic legs can't support the absurd weight. The fight has a three hit combo attack chain which can be hard to time visually due to the other side of the boss being basically invisible due to the scale of this monster. However, you can learn the timing due to the consistent length of this attack. Can this be hard to do? Yeah, but I don't view it as a problem. These games demand you learn a fight in and out, especially when you have to parry said fight. It's an agreed upon fact that in Sekiro you have to learn a boss in and out to be able to beat it. I strongly feel the same way with Liza P. But then for the first time in the game, phase 2, is a second full health bar. This has been a point of contention with the game, I don't see why. I know this can be hard, however the game gives more than enough abilities for you to deal with this stuff. You can melt the first phase rather quickly with breaking the posture of the boss or even using fire, because it's susceptible to this status effect. But the move set for this boss made me gasp for how inventive it was. Phase 2, while basically playing Duel of the Fates in the background, introduces Andreas the one-winged angel, and what you're greeted with is essentially two bosses. Each side of Andreas has a separate moveset. If I was to fault this fight, it does seem to be programmed to focus you on the frog monster thing over Andreas, making you face a fight in which you have already fought, but there are still some changes to the moveset. The timings for the monster's combos are faster, which makes the fight feel different from Phase 1, but yeah, you can also choose to focus on what whatever side you want, but most players will stick with what they know. The animation for the Switch is again amazing, I love the legs literally fumbling before giving way as it seamlessly switches to each fight. Yeah, this fight is absolutely incredible and I really hope it's set an example for the genre going forward because I want to see more stuff like this. Yeah, this boss made me realise there really is no excuse for the godskin duo, is there? The oldest of the Black Rabbit Brotherhood is a gank fight done well. Rather than a 4 and one relentless onslaught of attacks from four different sets of AI, the Brotherhood has a sensibility to position the fight to being a simply 2 on one This occurs whenever the eldest brother loses a significant chunk of health, starting with the youngest, then to the eccentric, and then ending on the battle maniac. Each member has a distinct moveset which makes for a great fight against a pack, as it were. All the while, as the three experienced fighters take turns, the eldest brother is a constant threat. The AI of the eldest brother is great, keeping within the confines of two attack patterns. Whenever a member is present in the fight, he stays passive while occasionally entering for a charge, telegraphed by both the splashes of feet in the rain, as well as an audio cue from himself. Without any of the Brotherhood, he is extremely aggressive, weaving in combo attacks of six to even seven moves. This is a considerable step up in difficulty to what came before. However, you never feel as if you're overwhelmed thanks to the parry system of Fable attacks. Fable attacks are charged by hitting an enemy over time. This is a more dynamic version of the mana system in my opinion. You can upgrade the factors in which a fable attack can be activated. For example, you can perfect guard and gain fable. This is all obtained with the P-Organ. The P-Organ, I think, is a brilliant inclusion to the Souls-like genre. Not only is it essentially a skill tree in which you can add to your arsenal with passive effects, such as a rising dodge or a more effective pulse cell. However, when the interesting innovation comes is through the added sub-skills. To unlock your chosen skill, you need to gain the required amount of quartz in which is obtained within the world and beating mini bosses or in some cases main bosses. Anyway, the skills are other passive skills on top of skills, we're saying skills way too much, which increase your power. For example, adding an additional pulse cell, charging pulse cells when you're discharged or empty on heals, or even increasing the durations or damage of fable attacks. I really like this system, it adds so much to the in-depth RPG style of these type of games. The Brotherhood can join the fight at multiple points of the Eldest Brother's health bar, however, if you take too long in not interacting with the boss, they will enter unannounced, so that means just standing there and running around and not parrying or doing anything. Similarly, if you take too much health off the Eldest without dispensing of the other brothers, all three can join the fight at one time, making it a 4 on 1, although the order in which they descend dictates the level of aggro on the player. For example, if you were to leave the youngest alive, once the eccentric comes down, he will be more aggro than the youngest. This is brilliant because it's stops the AI from just being a massive cluster just ganging up on you all the time, if you know what I mean. The moveset for every member is memorable as well as challenging to fight. I really enjoy this fight. Multi-battles aren't my favourite of these games, but this was a really well-balanced fight, which I really enjoyed. Like, it's genuinely shocking. 
to be honest, the fact that this boss is the midpoint of the game is absolutely ridiculous. Positioned in the most aesthetically pleasing arena in the game, King of Puppets is the equivalent of a From DLC boss in the middle of the campaign. The level of difficulty this encounter exacerbates is absolutely astounding. However, like every encounter in the game, it is spellbinding. Being the amalgamation of beautiful static animation with rigid body movements in which a puppet exhibits, to squash and stretch principles of his rubber sucker arms, the level of craft in the visual aspect of this boss is absolutely amazing. This is the epitome of the end of the game. The larger than life figure, cliche crown sat atop a wooden head, and it's the middle of the game. I, I love this fight. The telegraphed attacks, shown like everything else, is consistently great. From the first phase of admittedly repetitive 12 stomp, that would be my large criticism of the game. The varied attacks in which each boss has makes the code dance around trying to work out which attack to place in each sequence. And unfortunately, due to the amount of variety of each animation, a lot of the code overlaps resulting in the same attack over and over again. So this move is great to parry, but it is used way too frequently. But then phase two starts with the boss crying and begins with frantic arm swings. This is a great visual indication showing the player the reach this boss is now going to incorporate. Sure enough, there are so many varied attacks, ranging from long arms to walking on arms, sound pulses and projectiles, and every animation is fluent from one to the other, and it's one of the best fights of this genre. I, I full on believe this. And then phase two happens. Suddenly, this large, slow, massive puppet is revealed to be piloted by this lightning-fast, scythe-wielding killing machine. <laughs> this fight is hard. E even on New Game Plus, I'm struggling with this encounter. His timings for parries are so fast and scary that my first time beating him, I was too scared to parry. This was the moment where I kind of thought to myself, I think this game is too hard for casual players to complete if this is the midpoint, because this fight does feel like a From DLC. It's a tough fight to have two health bars and it creates this fight or flight response. Overall, I think it's still amazing. I don't really understand the controversy of the two health bar bosses in which this game has been criticised for. Yes, it's difficult, but this genre is difficult and the more you fight it, the more you master the fight until you can literally beat the first phase flawlessly. The feeling you get when that happens happens is euthoric. Surely this is the point of these games, overcoming the impossible, so no I don't really see the problem with it. This fight is visually spectacular as well as being technically marvellous. I guess the main criticism comes from it kind of takes away the aspect of shock or intrigue about a boss when you know there's going to be a second phase. Sure enough, yeah, this is true. Halfway through the game, nearly everything has a second phase and you're like, well, I kind of know where this is going. But again, it's just more of the game. I, I, I don't really see a problem in this. Overall though, this fight is just incredible. Like, wow. It's the shocker, mate. He shocks things. No, I really like this fight. It was a good fight. It was easy though. Fucking Alchemist Brian or whatever it's going to be called. Yeah, Alchemist Brian. Brian. So Alchemist Brian is a rather strange fight to put it lightly. The game thus far has prioritised the use of puppet based or carcass based boss fights and installs the tank himself. Alchemist Brian is a great fight. His larger than life stature can seem intimidating but at this point in the campaign you should feel comfortable in parrying. His attacks are super telegraphed and easy to read meaning consistently parrying isn't too difficult to achieve. It is a strange fight in the sense that it only consists of one health bar, kind of going back on what I just said. This makes the pace of the encounter rapid. His design is very Bane-esque from the Arkham series. I remember when he moved to Phase 2, all I thought was, oh dear. I love this moveset. It's like we're fighting a pro wrestler. It's fast while also being slow. It's heavy while also moving with fluidity. Alchemist Brian is consistent. That is the word I would use. He never moves in a way which shocks you, and because of that fact, personally, I found the encounter to be rather easy. Not on New Game Plus though, but it's a nice change of pace from the heart-pounding fury of Romeo to a controlled, reserved bloke. Sorry. The way he skids across the arena to fluently transition to his next move is so cool. I'm sorry I keep on going on about the animation, but this stuff is very hard to get right while also not being too fluent to be hard to read. The sweet point between the two extremes is where this genre thrives, and P is very good with it. I'll admit that I still only beat him by the skin of my teeth, 
due to the great mechanic where when you run out of pulse cells you get another by hitting an enemy until it fills once. Again, you can increase the way you can gain a heal through the subskill tree, but a neat feature I really like is after you use a pulse cell, to gain another you have to hit your opponent more times than previously to obtain a cell. This continues until you die or win basically. You can imagine how handy this came in when Alchemist Brian decided to start doing combos after breaking his posture. Being the first boss to do this in the game, it was a shock to say the least, but overall, this fight is fantastic, it's one of the best in the game. My god, this boss blew my mind. With the blandest name of the game and seeing what this boss would be like from the trailer, I was expecting this encounter to have a massive pool of constant poison which it would sit in, or have a status effect around the boss which poisons you, kind of like Blood Starved Beast. But no, instead we are gifted to a boss with one part of the body which inflicts decay and a fast, frantic phase one which incorporates burrowing into the ground, 5 hit combos and belly flops. The first phase is in my opinion, the harder phase of the two due to the long attack chains and the frantic nature of the boss. Phase 2 made me audibly scream with excitement. I love the scrapped Watchmen fight, and I was expecting some boss recycling in the late game, as is customary with these games, but I was expecting a rematch with maybe two of them, or a Parade Master and a Watchmen duo. I was not expecting the Swamp Creature to literally fuse with the scrapped Watchmen to retroactively create two movesets in which work in unison to one another. So, you have the original moveset, with added attacks thrown in such as a 4 jump combo as well as a new charge but after each move you get an added attack with the swamp monster tendrils. This is awesome. At random points of the fight the watchman will rotate its torso around for a crab attack which literally pinches you over and over again with decay with a great telegraph. Normally a decay move would be super annoying in an already ridiculous phase 2 but the consistency of timing with this hitbox made this move one of the easier moves to parry for me and I loved it. This was the moment I realised Liza P was on a roll I had never seen before. The amount of quality and imagination in these bosses was insane. This is the equivalent of the third quarter of the game and yet the fight still is just as polished as the first boss. What is this game? The consistency of each encounter is just mesmerizing. To put it in perspective, we have six bosses left to cover, and this is boss eight. I love this fight. I'm sorry to be gushing over it so much, but it did something in which From doesn't tend to do well, or at least not to this caliber with reused bosses, usually sticking two in a room and calling it quits, but the level of craft with this boss makes me think that From should be doing this now. Yeah, I love this fight. Okay, what's next? What was that about reuse content? Nah, in all seriousness, what the Swamp Watchman teaches the player is that carcass enemies can infect puppets. So how does Eliza P enforce this realization? By making sure in the next area you see the power this infection can have among everything you have probably dominated at this point. Another complaint I hear from some players is the lack of variety in the enemy encounters. I don't know what game they're playing, but P has so much enemy variety, this is just false. The amount of different mobs in which you'll engage with is staggering. Yes, there's a repeated zombie, but next to that you have the stomach thrower, the shield mob, the decay blobs, the decay scorpion humans, the carcass boulder hand enemies, the smaller carcass boulder hand enemies, the straight up panther crystal enemies, the scorpion dogs, tendril dogs, six armed carcass monsters, sword armed carcass monsters, massive head hammer carcass, blade mutated arm carcass, fast headless tendril people, legless tendril crawlers, and the bottled woman. This is just the carcass faction. This is without many mentioning a single puppet infected variant or any of the alchemist factions. So yeah, there's a lot. When these enemies start to combine to make new threats, the way you deal with them evolves too. You break posture of one of these new boys, you'd better be ready to counter another four to five times. So with that being said, when they reintroduce the Parade Master, but without a head for obvious reasons, the Parade Master has been fully infected by the mutated petrification disease that his head now spawns the suicide blob monster. Oh, look. <laughs> I missed one! The fight is, again, very good. While mixing up moves in which you're accustomed to, such as the belly flop being followed up by multiple smacks from his hand and whatever you can call his other hand, um, I can't really talk about this boss very much because when I was in it, I was basically dead or I beat it. Yeah, I beat this fight in 22 minutes. So all I got from it is a grab in which I didn't get to learn to read the tell. I did a new game plus and he kind of grabs you with his arm and then smacks it with his head, but yeah. The decay from the Parade Master was destroying my weapon, but I didn't realise this because I was too busy killing him. I just thought that he was a strong type of metal which was breaking my weapon. 
God, I'm dumb. Even the enemies he spawns never got in the way. So with that being said, how is the fight? Well, yeah, it's still good, but I honestly can't say. And with just one phase, this felt like a boss that was thrown in, but it's still not lazy. The visual design is still completely unique and adds new attacks, so yeah. It's still better than some of From's reused boss encounters, but I still feel like it's one that I forget most of the time. So that's literally just one I forget. Huh, wow, look at that. The rematch with the Black Rabbit Brotherhood is again a great use of a multi-fight just like the predecessor. I really liked fighting all three of the Brotherhood members. Just like the first instance, they all take turns to rush you rather than just all ganging up on you with three different movesets. However, at this point of the game, you can do just this. My first attempt with this boss was ridiculous because I had learned how the parries work completely in the game by this point. So if you do end up fighting the aggroed one near another, they will both be on you and somehow you can deal with this. I like most of the projectiles in this fight, orchestrated by all three of the brothers. The youngest throws knives, the eccentric throws bombs, but the battle maniac uses his puppet string. Now, the use of this mechanic in the first encounter was good because there wasn't that much going on. Now you have three people in a rather small arena. I'm not saying it's bad because that's not fair. A game gives an audio cue that it's happening, but to have the game wrench control away from you can be deadly. Genuinely, I died to this move more than anything else in the fight. I like the canonical fact that they were always the inexperienced fighters, so it makes sense that they all take turns in fighting you. Another reason being they're on edge ever since the eldest was brutally murdered by us, so yeah, they would be hesitant to attack you. The status effect on each brother are really good because it allows you to rush one you hate the most. For Luge, it was Decay. For me, it was Electric Shock. Sue me, I like my Fable Arts. So you can bet that spear-wielding Buckethead was dead first. But when you kill two of them, something happens. The eldest brother is resurrected through the aid of the alchemists. This is hinted at when you find a pamphlet about Alchemist Brian which shows that he died from an illness. Well, that clearly wasn't permanent. And then you think, shit. So the eldest brother can be partnered with the final brother alive. Each brother gives you a different reaction to the eldest brother being back. I like the fact that the battle maniac is obviously the one in charge through his muted reaction to the reveal compared to the youngest and eccentric reactions. The eldest brother is faster than he was previously, somehow. With the added aspect of an ergo wave wall, he's very aggressive, meaning you want to get rid of all the other brothers before he spawns. Good thing that the second phase triggers is when there's only one left, so you will the health down of the two who remain until you can kill them basically at the same time. Now, is this phase perfect? No, no, it isn't. It is still very good with lightning fast reflexes needed to beat the other brother. You have increased your skills with the parry, so the frantic nature isn't too bad to deal with. Although, looking up, I see people running around and just chipping away at them, and I'm like, come on, guys, like, come on, this is the end of the game. Sorry, I was mean, but still, it's Come on. However, what is bad is the posture break. Now, at this point in the game, you've seen attacks that come after breaking posture, but this one is taking the mick. It's the longest of the bosses while also being kind of too harsh. You can get the riposte of the eldest brother before he's done any of the moves because the prompt appears for about a second, but then the game's like, nah, and rips him out of the riposte and he'll attack you rapidly. This is a bug. I hope it's fixed because it's straight up not fair. You beat the game before the game says you can and you'll punish for it. Bar this, the fight is a fantastic return to an already polished multi-fight. What's next? Oh god. This boss gets a mention purely because it has a wall, but the boss is a gimmick boss. You hit the leg and the thing falls. The shock effect is the only time in the game where it feels annoying to have afflicted, because the boss is a rather bland, large enemy. With a simple moveset and not even a different score, it doesn't feel like it should have a wall. Not only that, but it also doesn't contain a spectre pool outside the boss, so I don't really know what to think of it. Spectres are a nice way of using summons to help you get through a fight. I don't like using summons for these type of games, but that's just my playstyle. However, what I like about the Spectres in this game is that they wield the weapon in which you may be able to acquire if you gain a boss ergo, because unfortunately, not every main boss drops an ergo. I'm looking at you, Brotherhood. God, I want that sword. But overall, I like that fact of the Spectres. Yeah, the Door Guardian is easy and is just kind of mid. But you know what? At least IGN got his gimmick boss, so all's well that ends well. Yeah. That's it. Seriously, that's it for the down moments. The rest of the fights are glorious, and none are better than Laxarsia, the complete. I've talked of the female encounter in Witches Perfected within my Bloodborne video. Laxarsia 
is the Melania of Eliza P. Positioned on the Great Bridge before the final climb up to the precipice of the tower, she is a presence, to put it lightly. After dispensing of Alchemist Brian easily, you think to yourself, Oh dear, what am I in for? Well, you get your answer when she drags her sword behind her as she walks up to you. Yes, walks. Obviously, this fight has two phases, but you would be amiss to think that due to the ferocity she shows in phase one. When entering this arena, all that happened in my experience was I would die. Why? Because I had prioritized guarding throughout the entire game, which meant I was determined to learn every single move of phase one. And you know what? I did. This encounter is immense. The amount of consecutive parries in which the game expects you to do is beyond anything you have achieved thus far. With so many animations and wind-ups, you would believe the fight would be overwhelming, but it isn't. Everything in Phase 1 feels cathartic in how it operates. The only negative for Phase being what I mentioned earlier with the King of Puppets, Laxarcy has so many attacks that a lot of the animation code will overlap, resulting in repeated moves. The most common offender being the Electric Grab, which transitions into a front kick and then a jab. This could repeat up to three times if you decide to advance after this animation. However, if you stay at the same point, she will continue with her other moves. I have no idea how many moves she has in Phase 1, but it's a lot. Her first move in which she will perform can either be a charging run attack with a simple guard block, or another run up where she'll slam a sword down into the ground, at which point after a second the ground will explode. This gives you the perfect chance to iframe the attack and advance with the fight. She has an uppercut frenzy, which is in my opinion the most satisfying move to parry in the entire game, as well as a frantic sword slam which she'll basically chase you to the end of the earth for. I struggle to get that final parry. There are so many move cues for Laxarcia to do a multitude of different attacks, such as if you parry one of the sword slams, she'll pause with a sign in which she's about to do an AoE lightning attack. I love this fight. This is the best fight in the game. Her armor acts as a damage debuff as your strike lands on solid metal, so your weapon is less effective. Equipped with a shield on her back, this makes strafing in this fight not the best option. However, if you break the shield on her back, you will find that her posture can be affected in any direction of her body. The shield isn't just a defense in phase one though. Phase two really does feel like a Melania moment as she sheds her armor and stands as one with the lightning. God, the cutscenes are amazing i love this shot how to describe phase two um it's tough it's it, it's very tough however if you didn't break the shield in phase one this phase is ultimately harder she can straight up block posture breaks the fact that there is a visual difference in the transition cutscene on whether or not you'll break the shield is so cool it cements the fact that the assets in this game are identical to the cutscenes this is something in which from have changed in the past thanks to zully the witch the insane dedication taken to discover all these secrets shows that, for example, Owl is a smaller asset in the cutscene to that of the game. I don't know, it's it's a nice touch. Phase 2 is scary, beginning with a small moment to breathe before she attacks shows the confidence in which the developer now understands the From philosophy. It is important to give the player a moment of reprieve before the onslaught of phase 2. Even Melania abides by this rule. So Laxarcia rises into the air, fires 6 lightning rounds before launching herself at you. In my honest opinion, this possibly might be the most difficult Fury attack timing in the game. Thanks to her distance, as well as the ability to run at you at the speed of light, it feels as if it's an unfair move, but it isn't. Because thanks to the consistent sound cue, you can time the perfect guard for when she's about to advance. Can I also mention that during the time in the air, you can perfectly guard all the lightning thrown at you to do damage to her, as well as if you get a perfect guard as she lands, the window for punishment is great. This brings her second health bar down three quarters or even half, if you have a Fable Art at full capacity. This advantage, if you capitalize on it, creates this balanced encounter with you and the boss, meaning that the two health bars don't look as intimidating as they could. The similarity to the fact that Melania has three quarters of a health bar at the start of phase two. The moves for the rest of the phase are difficult. She doesn't have delayed attacks per se, but they feel like it due to the fact that she could teleport around you as she strikes. So the lightning speed reaction time needed in order to guard these moves is very challenging to begin with, but can be euthoric when you learn the tells. The only piece of BS in the fight is the posture break. Many bosses have done so many of these moves after breaking the posture that it's fine to include them in this fight. The two swings are fine. What is cheap, is there is no other word for it, is the AoE lightning explosion which will definitely kill you on your first time seeing it. And if you're not confident with the fight, then your first time getting a posture break will be near death for Laxarcia. This move does so much damage in that moment, it is evil. 
It straight up is, there is no better word for it. The only positive for this move is the fact that the second time you see it and die, there isn't a chance in hell that you will be greedy after the two swings, because you will never die to this move again. Overall, with charge attacks of lightning, kicks which stagger you, flipping, teleporting attacks, rising into the air to shoot lightning bolts at you that can be parried back at her, descending AoE moves, lightning storms, as well as a constant electric shock after being thrown your way, this fight is a marvel of boss design. Four hours and 44 minutes spent were definitely worth it. I absolutely adore this fight and it is the perfect introduction to the finale of the game. Who will transgress? Look at his, look at his He's huge, legs. bro. Look at his what? little legs. <laughs> He's like Jack Horner. I don't know what I was expecting with Simon, but I don't think it was a kingpin sized blob with teeny little legs. Simon's appearance in phase one of this fight is straight up stupid. It's so funny. The idea that canonically his top hat grew when he transmuted himself to a god with the power of Ergo is just, just brilliant. I don't care. No, he didn't buy a new hat. That is the same hat. The reveal is such a tonal shift, coming from the shock of losing your latest waifu. God, they do break like Kit Kats these days, don't they? But genuinely, it is a really touching moment that is shattered upon the arrival of Fat Tony. Simon's first phase is rather simple in design, with very telegraphed attacks which admittedly cause significant damage to you. Nearly all of them are easy to parry, apart from the overhead slam of his staff thing. The main reason is because it leaves the screen when he charges the move making it difficult to gauge when the strike will land. Basically the exact same thing as King Flame Puoko. Well I say this is a problem when I could successfully do this, so who knows. Overall, phase one is incredibly simple, with great music and a small amount of health, even less now due to the patch for the game limiting his health in this phase. I get the nerf for phase two, but if you know what you're doing, he can do up to three moves before biting the bullet. So yeah, first phase Simon is easy and rather chill. It isn't boring, it's just calm. Phase 2 begins with the most visually pleasing cutscene in the game. The reveal of the infant god birthing from his side makes you think, the hell is going on? Panning up to the hands of God, which descend to finally touch the tip of the awakened God created by Simon is a clear reference to Michelangelo to the creation of Adam. It is a carbon copy of the moment with the blue ergo exploding its way onto the scene. This moment is fantastic narratively as it shows the final step of evolution for both characters. If P accepts the blue fairy Sophia's life force, he will become human, becoming the final form of evolution of a puppet. Simon, who was essentially a demigod to begin with, ascends to finally reach the precipice of life itself as he evolves into a god. So what's that like to fight? Insane. Simon Manus, Awakened God, is what you would expect from a final boss fight. His moves are well telegraphed and there's a ton of projectiles being thrown at you as well as AoE attacks. God, it's like the end of a blasphemous game. Anyway, I think where the fight exceeds is the timing of everything. Somehow, through Simon's summoning of disruption daggers, shockwaves on the ground, ways which wouldn't be amiss in Nameless King fight, all of this is synced with his attack windows. I can testify to this because I was one of those psychos that decided to parry each disruption dagger rather than outrun it. And what I learned from observation when I was perfect parrying a dagger, it would be the exact point Simon would swing his weapon. That is genuinely incredible. I can't imagine how hard it must have been to code this at this precise moment. It's like we're playing Hi-Fi Rush or something, where every single attack has to sync with a beat. Simon's physical moveset in Phase 2 is the same as Phase 1, which is in my opinion a great decision. Due to the player now having to deal with a completely separate moveset, courtesy of the Awakened God, the Awakened God has timing for attacks which sync with Simon himself. For example, Simon will dive behind you, you have to parry it again. The tell for this is the Awakened God charging a swing attack at you. When that attack lands, it's in unison with Simon's. Simon Manus is such a balanced fight in which incorporates so many ridiculous moves, such as the Hand of God descending and exploding three quarters of the arena. This move should be ridiculous. We're talking about an Elden Beast level move of an AoE on top of projectiles and a melee moveset, and yet, like everything else in this game, nothing is overwhelming to the point of saying, well, I shouldn't have died to that, because everything has an appropriate timing to dodge, guard, or react to the incoming move. The game has always punished greed, though. So, moments such as this sting. Yes, this was devastating. Not just because of him basically being one HP, but I did the entirety of the second half of Phase 2 discharged. 
But alas, I spent an extra 2 hours and 25 minutes after that to beat the Fat Slug. Commenting on my issues with this fight, I have none. Seriously, I have none. During my first playthrough of the game, I prioritised guarding everything. Guarding a powerful attack will send P staggering back, doesn't matter if it's perfectly guarded. To gain the upper hand again, you have to reach the enemy quickly in order to capitalise on that damage. My weapon had a long wind up on the heavy attack, which would consistently close the distance. However, Simon would tend to do an overhead slam after a two hit combo after break period, which punishes greed, sometimes. Other times he'll just have a two hit combo, this would mean that the heavy attack would either succeed or fail because I could not react fast enough to the overhead swing, but it occurred to me four hours later that maybe I should just get a light attack in and dodge if it comes, and after that I didn't struggle. So yeah, the fight is basically perfect for an ending battle against a literal god. Yeah, that's it. And you're done. Congratulations. To say the reveal of Geppetto being the main antagonist of the game was obvious would be an understatement. This felt intentional from the developers in order to make sure that most players would refuse to give him your heart, and what you're greeted to is what is in my honest opinion the clear design for the final boss of the game. At this point in the campaign the player would have incorporated guarding into their playstyle, so it would make sense that the final fight prioritises this mechanic above all. Split into two phases, the guard timings are not that demanding, they're not easy by any stretch of the word but rather familiar. Phase 1 is a fantastic illustration of the bastardization of the themes of the game from the lens of Gepetto. He relinquishes control of the nameless puppet, the physical manifestation of a puppet on a string. The visual is absolutely incredible. Gepetto as an antagonist works so well, abiding by the philosophy of what has no life will never have life. His ultimate goal is to revive his son who was lost to him. He achieves this by creating you to collect the ergo from the many battles you have encountered. You are the living embodiment of an ultimate killing machine. Gepetto is the cause of the puppet frenzy in which devastated Kratt. Learning this reveal, so many points start to click in your head. Romeo's message, the awakened puppets, rule zero of the Grand Covenant, discovered by Vanini when gaining access to the coda where you can understand the puppet language in New Game Plus. It's really cool. The Puppet Frenzy was the unfortunate realisation of the dangers of the alchemists harnessing Ergo through the petrification disease. The puppets were never meant to harm humans, nor did they. The term human is defined by Geppetto himself, and the petrification disease unfortunately muddles the distinction, leading puppets to view those who are infected as non-human. Geppetto needed two things to resurrect his son, a good heart and the arm of God. What he didn't intend on was Sophia turning back time to reanimate P. P is not Pinocchio. This is one of the main points which is interesting in the game. The book by Carlo Collodi exists in this world. It's something Geppetto obsessed over. So he made the puppet from the book, but he did not plan on P becoming human through lying and experiencing the joys of humanity. The story is a truly personal tale of the drive of grief as well as the loss and gain of humanity. I love the fact that you can encounter awakened puppets in this game, showing that the vast amount of ergo is stretched across a city of crap basically inflicting these puppets. Key awakened puppets of note are Polandina, Arlecchino and Romeo. Each embody a certain aspect of humanity. Polandina focuses on the aspect of love, Romeo is loyalty and Arlecchino is insanity. This shows that an awakened puppet may not always be a good thing. I'm sorry for going so deep into this aspect, but it's important to understand in order for this final fight to have the way it does. Nameless Puppet isn't just a machine. This is Carlo's mangled body which has been destroyed through overexposure of the P-organ. I said I wasn't going to make a single joke, I'm not doing it. And as a result, there is nothing left. So a horrifying image of Geppetto reanimating his son's body to fight you is so messed up. The ergo strings literally clinging onto the whisper of life from the body is such a great addition. Right, so the fight. The fight is perfect. It's quick while also slow as this reanimated puppet is being pulled around everywhere. The animations on display here are so beautiful to witness with possibly the easiest fury attack to guard as well as a varied move set which will punish you if you don't learn the opening moves. It's a cinematic encounter which suits this game. Every fight thus far has had a grand scale to everything. 
constantly expanding the scope through each encounter, whereas the final fight is literally the struggle of three beings with conflicting emotions. It nails that essence of the final fight of a From game, reflecting everything up to that point. The score is scary, there isn't a melodic nature to the track, but rather a mangled mess of choirs, sharp piano keys and drums. It feels as if this music is echoing around the arena. Phase 2 solidifies the connection to the fable with the literal detachment of the strings holding the puppet back. As the top of the head is removed, it shows the remnants of augmentation of a puppet and a human. Like the imperfection of Ergo which seeps into the puppet's granting humanity, the weapon of the nameless puppet wield splits into two forming actual scissors proving the strings have been severed. Just... <laughs> The attention to detail is the main reason why it annoys me so much when I hear people talking about the lack of spectacle from this fight. I don't think players know what they want anymore from these games. Liza P is essentially a Dark Souls 1 styled game with a Bloodborne and Sekiro movement. After the release of Elden Ring, it feels like bigger is better. This could not be further from the truth. Bloodborne is loved mostly through its focused perspective on the world and story. The ending isn't this massive world ending shattering boss where the, well, yeah, yeah, it can be, I guess. But the point is, P delivers on that feeling captured from Dark Souls 1, and for some reason, people don't want to acknowledge that, but rather focus on the fact that Nameless Puppet is a Lady Maria clone. <sighs> Well, it's not. It borrows a hue from Maria, that being bright red. Oh, <gasps> how dare it! Maria used blood attacks which slash across her weapons. There is no blood in this fight. The red comes from an explosion of rage within the nameless puppet. His moves are so free flow, I love it. Phase 2 is almost like a dance of guarding and attacking. The constant flood of memories rising to the surface of P being played back during the fight shows the living embodiment of what Geppetto wanted but never understood correctly. The stagger attack in this fight is the the first time the response comes after the repost. This was a great way of changing up the formula. If you were to dodge or perfect guard this attack, you gain the advantage of punish him as he recovers. The flow of the attacks, the fluidity of this fight and the atmosphere created ends the game on a massive win. As a final fight, this has all the hallmarks to being one of the best of the genre. So why isn't it being tre- as such? Well it's simple. It's a Souls-like. This game could never be as good as From Software. This is not my opinion, look at any outlet. Hell, even IGN criticised the UI being too similar to From. Yeah, they're right to be fair. I mean, why would they use the same colour scheme in which everyone knows for each non-diegetic component? I suppose that means Blasphemous is too similar to From as well. It has a stamina bar, as well as a red health bar. Sorry, I know I shouldn't be so petty, but it is annoying. I fully believe that if you were to take Neil Wizz's and Round 8's name off this product and slapped From Software on this game, it would be in that category in which From have reigned supreme. It would gain tens across the board. The only reason people don't connect with this game is because it's a Souls-like. That's it. The fact that this game is being lumped into the same conversation as something like Mortal Shell or Famizia is so strange to me. Nothing against those games, but they're not on the level of this game, they're, they're just not. Even games which people thought this game would be similar to, such as Steel Rising, taking a glance at that game you can tell it isn't in the same league as P. What this product demonstrated is that no matter how great something can be, the gaming audience will not acknowledge it. This is unfounded to me. Surely the whole point of a medium like this is to improve on what came before, right? Other media have accepted this fact. Films evolve through time, as not every film is how it's presented like how it was in the 2000s. Same with music. So many genres and innovation in which has transformed the art form over the years. Gamers don't work like this. From Software is an amazing company in which has pioneered a new genre in gaming, but that begun nearly 20 years ago. There should be room for evolution. It's almost hilarious when you think about Simon's goals in the game about evolving from what came before. This definitely wasn't a metaphor, but it is funny. The central question of this video illustrates the difference between inspiration and plagiarism. I hope to reassure viewers that this game is not plagiarising from software. Despite the similarities to tones such as Bloodborne or Sekiro Spark animation, 
Yes, the game has a world in which there is an infection which is spread across a city and which forced the downward spiral of a civilization, like the hunt in Bloodborne. Also like the setting of Bioshock, Blasphemous, Soma, Last of Us, Dying Light, A Plague Tale, Resident Evil 4, The Division, Prototype, Knack 2. What is clear with all of these games is that they are not Bloodborne clones. The way in which P plays is the genre it abides within. The same as how Call of Duty will fundamentally play the same way as Battlefield. So yes, it is going to play similarly to Bloodborne or Sekiro with combat, looping back levels and powerful bosses. The levels in P are all gloriously realised with so much colour and atmosphere, with the added ability of allowing the player to traverse levels which play with elevation as you traverse rooftops, look down at what you have explored. The area shows such a difference in the class system of Krat. The busy streets of Rosa Isabel Street are widely different to that of the plaza or even Moonlight Town. I feel the game illustrates its diversity within its world because the city of Krat was a thriving environment before the outbreak. The complete opposite of Bloodborne, although I don't enjoy the same colour palette and insistence of the same architecture and level layout of the city of Yharnam, I now understand that the city was never a real city, but rather existed in the realm of religion above all, so there would be no individuality to the setting, but I still don't like it. P does not have the level design of From Software, with all the levels being linear with simple shortcuts. None of them are bad though, and some even have unique shortcuts which stand out as variety, but no level is bad in any regard. There is no problem with it being linear title, it's so obvious from the start that they wanted to do this. I know people don't like the fact that you can't go to different areas, and I agree, it would have been cool to have an optional area, maybe with a really hard boss, but that's not what the developers set out to do, so that shouldn't really be criticised, because this is what they wanted to do. The combat may be similar to From games, but the added ability to the visual weapon durability and breaking of the weapons of enemies makes the distinction clear. Separating the blade and hilt was an incredible mechanic which solves the problem of keeping to one build throughout. The amount of times in which you would pick up a weapon in this genre and realise you couldn't use that weapon due to the amount you have invested into this chosen tool, allowing the hilt to have a little upgrade potential allows customization of your build and playstyle. This is innovation! With 29 main weapons in the game, all of which can be customised and changed to create something new, there are so many animations for each one, whereas boss weapons are non-customisable but have unique traits. I am currently playing through New Game Plus with the katana and I can tell you it is an entirely different playstyle. This is all new. I hope that everything I've discussed here shows that Liza P does exceed From in certain areas such as bosses and weapon variety, but From still excel at areas and lore. I love the story of this game, but I'm not going to say it's better than From. But do I think that Liza P is a better game than From games? Yes, I do. Nothing will beat that feeling of beating Dark Souls for the first time. I know that. I think Liza P is better, balanced, and more polished than Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2, Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3, Sekiro, and Elden Ring. It isn't perfect but it is the most consistent gaming experience I think I have ever had. I hope that people realise what a monumental achievement this game is for the genre. I hope From look at Neowiz and Round 8's first attempt at this type of game and improve upon it. That's what we all want, for our favourite developers to improve and innovate, and Liza P is being hindered in doing that. Liza P is an inspiration to other developers to do better in this genre, and I really hope that they do.